On February 7th, 2023, Canon announced the new compact, lightweight APS-C EOS R50. This comes after Sony released their first Alpha Series interchangeable lens vlog camera, the ZV-E10, on July 7th, 2021, almost two years before. I've done a ton of research online and dug into the specs of both of these cameras. And on paper, this is a very close matchup. I was hoping to come up with a definitive answer on which one was better. Now that I've gotten my hands on the Canon R50, thanks to Lens Rentals, I've immersed myself in both of these cameras and I have a conclusive answer, which I will share with you. There is one huge advantage the R50 has over the ZV-E10. So don't be so quick to think you know what my conclusion is. Tell me what your thoughts are on both of these cameras because I'd be super interested to know your opinion. The RF lenses that I rented along with the R50's body are as follows. The kit lens, an 18 to 45 millimeter F4 5.5 to 6.3, a prime lens 50mm f1.8, and a zoom lens 55 to 210 f5 7.1, which gave me the perfect lineup to compare it to the ZV-E10 and some Sony lenses that I own. The kit lens, which is a 16 to 50mm f3.5 to 5.6, a prime lens 50mm f1.8, and a zoom lens the 55 to 210 f4.5. We're going to be looking at the specs, but also that image quality. I've had the ZV-E10 for over a year and a half, but that's not how it used to be. There was a point in time where I would have had no idea which one of these two cameras I should go with, so I hope by the end of this video you have all of that information so you can make an informed decision. If you're into videos like this one, make sure to like this video so I know to continue to make videos like this one. So now I'm going to tell you how it is, like it or not, today on the Film Alliance. So we're gonna deep dive into not only the specs, but the image quality, which in my opinion is really the most important thing, then comes usability, and then ecosystem. kind of on the fence about buying a new camera like the R50 or the ZV-E10 or some other piece of camera gear, rent it from Lens Rentals like I did. I always try out stuff before I make a big purchase by renting it out. I can tell you it saved me so much time and headache, especially if I end up not liking the camera or the gear and then having to sell it on the used market. I have a 15% discount code, which I'll leave in the description, which will save you a little bit of money and make me a small commission. Before we get into all the differences, I wanna get the similarities out of the way. They're both priced super close together. Together. They weigh about the same. They both have one SD card slot. They both have electronic stabilization. Both have 24 megapixel sensors. They both have fully articulating screens, mic ports, an HDMI out, and a USB-C for power and streaming. They can both shoot in 4K up to 30 frames per second and HD up to 120. And they're both great hybrid cameras, meaning you can shoot video and photos with them. Now I'm gonna free flow with you my user experience, which I was able to pick right up on because I've had the ZV-E10 for so long, so all of the little subtle differences that I found in the R50, they really stood out to me. The R50 has a viewfinder and it has a more traditional camera feel with a better hand grip, while the Sony ZV-E10 has more of a sleek and compact design that looks more modern. The EVF on the R50 is an advantage over the ZV-E10, especially when you're shooting outdoors or if you're into macro photography because the viewfinder will really help you nail focus. The LCD screen on the ZV-E10 is okay, but I've come home before after shooting and found some of my footage was out of focus, just enough to tick me off. Whereas when I used the viewfinder on the R50, I was spot on on all of my shots and I was able to nail that focus. The LCD screen on the R50 has 1.62 million dots, whereas the ZV-E10 has 921,000. And from a user perspective, you can definitely tell a difference. If I were never to use the R50, then I would have told you that the ZV-E10 screen is great. But once you use a better LCD with more detail, you're like, oh, now I can't unsee it. Speaking about the screen on the Canon, it has a touch screen, whereas the ZV-E10 only has touch focus. But I don't recommend you using either touch function on your screen because your fingers have oil on them and once you start touching your screen
screen over time they get muddied up just like an editing monitor I don't like to touch it but maybe for some people that's the easier route and if I'm in a pinch I'll use the touch tracking on the ZV-E10 when it comes to stabilization Canon comes in regular and enhanced both regular and enhanced do crop in a little bit actually I'm not sure I forgot to look at that but I don't remember what it was I'll leave it up on the screen I know enhanced definitely crops in I don't care what people say obviously enhanced is better but crops in much further Sony crops in a lot more once you activate active stabilization. Now time out for a second. Both of these cameras are APS-C, meaning whatever focal length your lens is, you have to multiply that by 1.5. And I've also heard you have to multiply the aperture. But with Canon's kit lens coming in at 18 millimeters at its widest, and Sony's kit lens coming in at 16 millimeters at its widest, that puts you right about 27 millimeters with this thing and 24 millimeters with this one. And then once you turn on these stabilization modes, let me put it this way, you're not vlogging. You're macro filming your face, at least at an arm's length. The ZV-E10 has gyro data, which means you can leave stabilization off and then run it through Sony's free software, Catalyst Browse, and get some of that super smooth footage. But Canon doesn't have such software, which means if you wanna get that super smooth stabilized footage and you throw this thing into enhanced, you'll have to get a wider lens, or you'll have to put this on a gimbal. More on lenses later in the video, which in my opinion is one of the key pieces to the entire puzzle. So when it comes to stabilization, I'm gonna give it to the ZV-E10 due to its gyro data. But both cameras have decent stabilization as long as you're not vlogging. Both cameras also have atrocious rolling shutter, especially when you're shooting with long lenses. If you're shooting with a zoom lens, I highly recommend you pick up a monopod like the YC Onion Panetta to stabilize that rolling shutter. Now the gyro info inside of the ZV-10 can fix that rolling shutter in Catalyst Browse, but that's just another step you have to take in post-production. The ZV-10 has a headphone port, which is nice for shooting headshot interviews, or even to monitor your audio and make sure that your camera isn't picking up some weird frequency, whereas the Canon does not have a headphone port, so you're kind of at the mercy of visually looking at your audio level. I also appreciate that on the Sony, it has a dial on the top, which I use for aperture, and this scroll wheel, which I use for rolling shutter, shutter speed. The Canon only has one dial on the top, which you can toggle between shutter speed and aperture, which does produce an extra step. Sony allows you to set your frame rate to 120 frames per second, which will record your audio for more flexibility in post, whereas Canon doesn't record audio, so you'll have to be very intentional on what you're shooting when you're shooting slow motion, meaning you'll have to have music or sound design or a voiceover over that footage. I prefer Sony's method of allowing you to record audio with your 120 frames per second clip, and you can set it to playback in normal speed and slow down in post. It gives you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to creativity. Now Sony also has an S and Q mode, but I only use the 120 frame rate option that I manually set inside of the menu system. Some people like the old Sony menu system and some people hate it. I've become very comfortable with it over the years, so I don't mind it, but I can tell you for sure Canon's menu system is way easier to navigate. Even filming with the Canon was more of a breeze than with the ZV-E10 when I first got it because I was easily able to learn it so fast and as far as finding the things that I need quickly. So the menu system goes to the R50. Both cameras have a product showcase mode Mode, and in Canon's lingo, they call it a product demo mode. This is super helpful when you're doing product shots and don't want the focus to get locked on your face and you're trying to block your face while you're showing your audience something. This is also a great feature for thumbnails. One click makes the focus stay on your product and you don't have to block your face to get that shot. I get about an hour and 10 minutes when I'm shooting 4K24 with the ZV-E10 on a full battery and found that it to be about the same with Canon, although I read that ZV-E10 batteries last a little bit longer, but it it all depends on whatever MAH your battery is. The higher the MAH, the more battery life you will get. Maybe look on Amazon for third-party batteries with longer lasting MAH, but you didn't hear that from me. The Canon can shoot in 60 minute increments and the ZV-E10 can shoot unlimited. You may think this isn't a big deal, but what happens is you get into a client setup, maybe you have an A cam and you have a B cam. You're in a position where you can't check on your B cam. The client goes long, your camera stops recording and you didn't know it. And then after the interview, you go over and you see that your Canon stopped after 60 minutes. That's one of the huge benefits to the ZV-E10. And that's why I thought I would throw it in here. It's happened to me. I found that the ZV-E10 operated better in low light. And I'm not sure why this is because they both have the same sensor. So that's a question for those of you who are smarter than me. Now, why would that be? Even shooting with the same aperture and lens setup, the R50 had more noise in the darks. 
Both cameras downsample from 6K to 4K and shoot in 8-bit, which makes using some of the log profiles more of a gimmick in the ZV-E10 than actual real-world usability, in my opinion. If you light your subject properly, then you can have some fun with log profiles, but most of the time when I'm running gunning, I'm gonna do Cine 2. But the Canon can shoot in 10-bit in HDR PQ mode. Also, there's no crop in shooting in 4K on either of these cameras unless you're shooting in 30 frames per second on the ZV-E10. When it comes to photography, the Canon has focus bracketing, which is a really nice feature, so you can focus on something in the foreground and the background at the same time. The ZV-E10 does not have this, plus the EVF on the R50 makes it a better camera for photography, in my opinion. The R50 also has a special scenes for maybe beginners who want a quick template for how your exposure should look inside of your camera, and the camera automatically dials that in for you. Things like portrait or handheld night scene and HDR backlight control. I tend to try to wrestle the exposure settings manually and just introduce better lighting, but this feature is great for beginners and run and gunners. The ZV-E10 also has a portrait shooting mode, but again, I prefer manually exposing and just using ND filters. So when it comes to lenses, the elephant in the room is that Sony has a way bigger selection at cheaper prices. Third parties offer a ton of great lens options for the ZV-E10, and Canon seems to have, at least as of now, have a very limited selection. The Canon kit lens comes in with an 18 to 45 millimeter, and like I said, you won't really be able to vlog with that lens. I feel like the R50 looks and feels kind of like a vlog camera, but there's really no lenses that will support that. Whereas there are a ton of great lenses for the ZV-E10, like the Viltrox 13, which will give you about a 20 millimeter equivalent, or a Sony 11 millimeter, which will give you about an 18 millimeter equivalent if you're into vlogging. When it comes to APS-C, Canon is kind of just falling behind when it comes to their lenses, or lack thereof, and the options that are available. Canon's R mount makes it a hard sell for me. If you had the Sigma Trio for the ZV-E10, you would blow the R50 out of the water because the R50 wouldn't even be able to compete. Even the kit lens on the ZV-E10 is slightly better than the Canon R50 kit lens. The ZV-E10 seems to be better in most aspects of video shooting when it comes to post workflow, and the R50 is somewhat better for straight out of camera. The difference between the Sony and the Canon is Sony sort of allows an entire ecosystem of lenses and accessories to be developed, and Canon puts a hold up or only allows very few companies to jump on that train. So in my conclusion, the R50 is a great camera, but the lenses aspect for me is a deal breaker. Although I was shocked to see how good that 10-bit HDR our footage was, it was definitely better than Sony's 8-bit, and that's why I think the R50 wins when it comes to image quality. If you compare the R50's 8-bit 4K to Sony's 8-bit 4K, I'd say they perform different in different lighting conditions, and it's for that reason I don't really have a favorite. But when you use the HDR mode in the R50, it blows the ZV-E10 out of the water. The Sony ecosystem and lens selection, however, is what's most important to me, so that's going to be my preference, and I'm going to stick with the Sony. With Sony, you can get similar results with HLG, but if you don't convert that to Rec. 709, a lot of people with older monitors will see footage that looks overexposed. I had that happen to me when I tried to create a video about shooting HLG with the Sony ZV-1. But with that being said, when you convert the HLG to Rec. 709, it does diminish some of those brilliant colors. So I'm still holding out for the ZV-E1 and its 10-bit full-frame capabilities. Let me know which one of these cameras you like better in the comment section. And until the next one, I'm Joe with the Film Alliance. Have a nice week. Was that good?